I think we see a lot of coordination globally on, on making things much more open in terms of the data sets and the data products that we have. And, and that certainly helps collaboration in, in incredible ways. Um, it takes away all these barriers and all this paperwork and having to you know, figure out interesting ways to share information with one another. Because that's what scientists want to do, right? They want to work with somebody that has a like interest to figure out what they're interested in. Hi, I'm Stephanie Tomampos, and you're listening to Down to Earth, the show where we talk to incredible geoscientists about their science and its impacts on our planet. Last episode, we explored new space. In today's episode, we take a look at another movement that might seem to be completely opposite from new space, the open science movement. This episode of Down to Earth is sponsored by the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society's Technical Committees. The GRSS Technical Committees actively promote discussion and advances in many different areas of remote sensing, ranging from new technologies to environmental analysis and many areas in between. To learn more about the technical committees and how you can get involved, visit their website at grss-ieee.org slash technical committees. I really got interested in, in managing and making data and science available um, when I was in graduate school. I was trying to access lots of information pretty um, regularly to develop land cover maps and, and other inputs for carbon modeling groups. And it took me longer, seriously, to try to figure out how to pay for and order all of those products than it did to do the work. So it took me probably about three and a half, four years to, to gather the data set I needed to do the work. And then it probably took me about 18 months to do the work. And, you know, that's where I started um, kind of merging both the scientific aspect of the work I was doing along with a lot of the data science work that I was doing. This is Dr. Kevin Murphy, Chief Science Data Officer for NASA Science Mission Directorate. Through this role, Kevin is working to increase information accessibility across all divisions of the Science Mission Directorate, because to him, open science enhances the scientific process. There's a whole group of people in the world that probably don't traditionally have either uh, the credentials or the opportunities to access the scientific processes, especially with these these big missions that we have and, and large data sets that we have. And we're trying to really open that up so people can have transparency into how it's done, be included in the process itself if they so desire, and really make a difference in, in how quickly we can do science. To Kevin, accessibility, transparency, and inclusion are fundamental components underpinning scientific progress, which is why he's a firm believer in the open science movement. So let's start with the term open science. What does it mean and can you define it for us? Sure. So open science is the collaborative culture enabled by technology that empowers open sharing of data, information, and knowledge within the scientific community and the wider public to accelerate scientific research and, and understanding. And, you know, I, I think that that definition really, really shows that we need accessibility to the scientific process and knowledge. Um, we need to make the research and knowledge um, sharing much more efficient. And we also need to understand how well we're doing it, right? We have to understand the scientific impact of that work. Why is accessibility, transparency, and inclusion so important in science these days? Um, I think, you know, science is is impacting people's lives in, in so many different ways these days. And, you know, I think you really need to be able to trust it and you need to be able to understand how science is being done. So so transparency, I think, is is critical to the scientific method and the trust in science as we have a much more data-driven um, society. Accessibility, you know, is saying that this isn't just in the hands of a few um, people that know best. It's, it's allowing people to participate in that scientific process um, and to add unique knowledge that they may know um, to help extend it and improve it over time. And finally, you know, I, I think inclusion is, is really, really necessary as well and, and something that's often overlooked um, because particular groups or particular locations or individuals have unique skills that contribute, can contribute to, um, you know, the scientific work that we do but also can really help accelerate the activities because they know those specific things that we need to be able to do. 
So I think those three things are, are, are absolutely necessary to achieve open science. Just a quick question on trust, because we covered that topic in another episode. Lots of people are currently mistrustful of science. How will open science help with the building of public's trust in science? I think, you know, that that's a tough question. You know, the thing that we can do um, by making things open is, is to kind of like take away any of the uncertainty related to um, how things are done, what techniques are used, what data is used, and allow people to do it for themselves, right? When a lot of the work is closed and the assumptions that went into it aren't publicly available, it makes it easier to have an opinion not based necessarily on the facts or the data, but to have them because you don't have access to them. So when when things are open, there's less ability to kind of throw those arrows of, hey, you never shared this, or you didn't know that, that or your assumption was incorrect here. So you know, when we're looking at doing scientific research, having it open, I think is, is vitally important for people to um, have that trust. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily that, you know, it, it's easy, right? Science isn't easy. You've got to spend the time to understand um, how things work. You can't take some data and use it for a purpose which it was never intended to use and make assumptions off of that. But I think openness also helps combat those types of activities because if you do work with information that's not meant to be um, used in that way, um, it becomes apparent and obvious very quickly. So I think what you're talking about here in some ways is citizen science. So in your view, is citizen science important? How can we leverage it for the betterment of society? I think citizen science is a critical component of open science. I think citizen science, and, and we've had a program that I've run for a while now on citizen science, is really a game changer in terms of the participation and the ingenuity that that comes along with it. Getting people that are really interested in specific topics not because they get paid to do it, not because it's their livelihood, um, but just because they're incredibly interested in it is is a powerful motivation for innovation, right? They do things that, you know, people that might have to win a competitive grant wouldn't do necessarily, and they do it for much longer often. So, you know, I think it's critical that as we build an open science ecosystem, that we build into it um, ability for citizen science activities to be I'm used to really harness the creativity and innovation that they have and kind of desire that they have to participate. But, but not only that, you know, I think it also opens up the capacity for us to do things like challenges and hackathons and, and other prizes to really engage with communities that we typically haven't worked with in the past and encourage them and incentivize them to participate. Okay, let's take a step back now. How did the open science movement come to exist? What were some of the reactions within the scientific community? Um, so, you know, to a certain extent, I would say that the open science movement started with kind of the scientific process back when we started to do publications. I think what's really changed over the past 20 to 30 years is, one, the reliance on like computational infrastructure to do science in large scale. The second thing is is the ability of the internet to, to widely distribute information much more quickly and without the necessity of the historical kind of publishing infrastructure that was necessary to communicate scientific information. And the easy sharing of data and software on those computational infrastructures to recreate some of, of the work, right? So I think the Human Genome Project is probably one of the, the first examples that I know of where they kind of took the principles of, of saying, hey, we're going to make everything open from the beginning. Um, we're going to share our results um, as we obtain them. Um, we're going to share the software as we retain them. And, you know, I, I think that, that the Human Genome Project really pushed forward a lot of innovation. I think, you know, it, it's changed how science has been done um, in a lot of ways. However, like as you point out, you know, scientists in different fields spend years and years, you know, dedicated to the work that they do, developing the knowledge, the information, the data, um, the processes that they use to conduct their work. And, and it can be difficult to say, I now have to make all of that open. Thankfully for me, um, coming into the positions I've been in, you know, NASA um, has had an open data policy since the mid 1990s. Right, which which was pretty difficult to do back then, but it was applying to 
the data from missions that were going to be launched like five years later. So they implemented these policies at the very beginning of these missions and say, hey, these are the ground rules. These are what you're going to have to do. Um, so people started to get used to kind of open science with the introduction of open data policies. However, you know, as we try to inch open science into the other components of our environment, it can, you know, create some antibodies among scientists that don't want to share. And, you know, what we have to do is work with them to figure out what incentives really help them move in that direction. Um, because making this information open is, is only going to benefit um, a much wider group of people. Convincing scientists to embrace open science principles isn't the only challenge facing the movement. In fact, there are more. In the next part of this episode, Kevin shares some examples of these hurdles and how the scientific community is working to overcome them. We also put Kevin on the spot to answer a potentially sticky question. Can new space and open science exist at the same time? Stay tuned to find out. Are you looking to make an impact in geoscience and remote sensing science? Then consider joining one of the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society's technical committees. From environmental analysis to spaceborne imaging spectroscopy, each technical committee advances innovative research and technology in a specific field of remote sensing. By joining, you'll connect with a community of passionate researchers and professionals who are fostering important international collaborations and steering global research agendas. You'll also gain access to the latest news and state-of-the-art research in the field. Expand your network, enhance your career, and make a difference. Join a GRSS technical committee today by visiting grss-ieee.org slash technical committees. Welcome back. Today, we've been talking all things open science with Dr. Kevin Murphy, Chief Science Data Officer for NASA's Science Mission Directorate. As a reminder, open science is the sharing of data, information, and knowledge within the scientific community and the wider public to accelerate scientific research and understanding. NASA is a great example of an organization that has been embracing open data and open science principles since the 1990s. For example, they have a new program called the Earth System Observatory where all the missions must be open source science. This means that all the pre and post data are open access, including the documentation, the algorithms, and all the scientific papers published after the mission. But as Kevin mentioned, while the open science movement is full of promise in terms of scientific advancement and innovation, it's not all rainbows and butterflies. There are plenty of challenges the movement will have to tackle to make it feasible for scientists to fully participate. So you touched on this in some of your answers, but in your view, what are the biggest challenges facing the open science movement right now? I think some of the big challenges are that the data is big and it's increasing in size. With every new mission that we launch and every day, we, we get more and more information. Currently, NASA, I think, generates around uh, 15 to 20 petabytes of data a year, maybe a little less than that. But in a couple of years, we're going to be producing around 60 petabytes of data per year, right? So that, that's an enormous amount of data and an enormous problem. And when you add that with the data from the other space agencies, it becomes just enormous. So there is obviously that like data movement problem. And I think the other big one is related to incentives. Our current kind of academic and research incentives do not highlight the need for openness. They're looking at H scores or what have you in journals for like tenure positions. And I think that needs to change a little bit. It needs to recognize that contributions to openness are equally as important as the number of kind of closed journal articles you publish. You mentioned earlier that part of your motivation to embrace open science was because of the difficulty you encountered accessing data when you were doing research as a student. And I can completely relate to that. So what's the solution there? I think we need to figure out as a community how to incentivize publication in like green and gold journals, which have no redistribution rights. And I think that there's a general movement too, right, among folks to to publish in them anyhow, right, to, to really uh, get their word out to more and more people. So do you think open science means also additional funding because you need to provide that platform to all the people around the world? Absolutely. Open science isn't free science. Open science is a deliberate activity to make 
investments in, in the capabilities to make things open. So yeah, I think additional funding is necessary and you're not going to be able to do it without it. So is the movement currently addressing some of the challenges that you've mentioned? Can you give us an example? So I think, you know, there are a lot of challenges with this because it changes how people do their work. There's a lot of policy guidance from the federal government, including laws and executive orders that push people to do and make research with federal funding open. NASA specifically is is starting to incentivize and require people to make things open, including in the new solicitations for research grants and new missions that we're doing. Um, But this isn't something that we can do alone. We have to do this in partnership with, with many of the other agencies and universities. And it's really got to be a collaborative effort to work forward with. Because, you know, if one agency just makes everything open, it doesn't help open science in general. Let me give you kind of one example that NASA and ESA are working on. You know, NASA and ESA have some very sophisticated capabilities in space and will be launching some new ones in in the not too distant future. Um, What ESA and NASA have done is we've developed this um, platform called the Multi-Mission Algorithm and Analysis Platform which allows the scientists from ESA and the scientists from NASA to work together to develop a common biomass map globally that uses the best of all of their um, capabilities. They can share their software on it. They can share the in situ data or the the data on the ground that helps them calibrate and validate the, the satellite measurements. They can share the models that they use and they can do it much more efficiently. And they can do basically team science using kind of these open science principles and infrastructures. So it really allows a significant amount of collaboration with low friction because of the the technology introduced um, to really develop a much better answer at the end, one that everybody understands and is much more internally consistent. So on that note of collaboration, here's a big question. In one of our episodes, we talk about new space, where companies are moving into the space sector and producing and selling data using their own satellite systems. How does the open science movement converge or diverge from the new space movement? Is there a place for both movements? Or how can they work collaboratively for the betterment of remote sensing science and society at large? So so I think there's absolutely a need and a space for both public and private investment and remote sensing investments. A lot of the capabilities that and, and basic understanding of how like the physics work of remote sensing came from these public investments, right? They're, they're really laying the basic science out. But certainly, you know, public investments in these things can't do everything and nor should they. You know, there, there's a space for private industry to work as well. And, and I really think that the partnerships between public and private in this instance are critical. We have a need as a government agency to work with the best available information to solve our problems. And sometimes that information is available from commercial vendors. Sometimes it's available from international partners. Sometimes it's available internally. And the research that we produce helps all of those areas because, you know, the publications that we do are open to anyone to use for any purpose. If you know we go out and purchase information like we do with the commercial small sat data acquisition program, you know we have to negotiate with companies on licenses for use of those products. And when we try to negotiate those licenses, we try to make sure that we can really do kind of what we do at NASA, which is global research. But it's difficult because you know if you make everything open they can't sell anything so they can't build more things or come up with new ideas and launch them so it's just a tough issue but we're still learning a lot and partnering with commercial entities and i think that there's a a, a lot of potential for these new space companies or small sat data providers to contribute significantly um, to understanding you know the earth systems their interactions and making kind of actionable information from that So, you know, look forward to working with them in the future and exploring how we work together in this open science framework over time. I agree on that. I think partnerships is the answer and there are so many gaps to fill. So both public and private institutions bring unique strengths to the field and we can benefit from both. So if you had to picture the future, 
what's your ultimate hope for the open science movement? Where do you think it will take us into the future? So what I would like to see from open science in the future is um, an acceleration of scientific results that can have real differences on how people live and how they understand their environment, their universe, and basically extending that to more and more people to participate in the process. We are blessed with an incredible amount of information from highly sophisticated scientific platforms and getting as many people to participate in using that information for the betterment of the environment or our understanding is where I'd like to see it go. Well, that's all for this season of Down to Earth. To learn more about NASA's participation in the open science movement, visit earthdata.nasa.gov, which is NASA's hub for free and open earth science data. Be sure to follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts where you can satisfy your down-to-earth cravings with the amazing episodes from Season 1 and be updated on any future seasons of the podcast. Finally, don't forget to send some love to our sponsors at IEEE underscore GRSS on Twitter and Instagram and IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing on Facebook and LinkedIn. This episode was produced by Nicole Bedford from Nicole Bedford Films with help from me, Stephanie Tumapos. Graphics and design by Mylene Briggs of Killam Media. And a special thanks to Fabio Pachifici and Keely Roth for their support. I'm Stephanie Tumapos and you've been listening to Down to Earth.